A person's fragrance says a lot about their character, and spritzing yourself with a delightful niche fragrance has become a luxury of self-expression. Entrepreneur Shade James, no doubt a fashionista, a lady of style and grace, knows that your fragrance should say a lot about you. She has carefully selected UAE's finest perfumes, making it available right here in South Africa. There is certainly a fragrance within her wide selection to match your character and suit any occasion. Whether you are a fan of the fruity, orientals, florals, aquatics, gourmand and more, at UAE Fragrances you will have it all the most luxurious brands available. Let your scent introduce you. Welcome to Dining and Vibing in SA and a Happy New Year. There is no more striking symbol of transformation than a butterfly. From egg to larva, to leaving the safety of the cocoon and emerging as a butterfly in her unfurling glory, the transformation that takes place almost before our eyes symbolically represents hope and new beginnings. Therefore, we thought we will start the new year and showcase a transformed life at the Butterfly Farm on the South Coast. Be sure to visit them for your next holiday destination. Hi everybody, my name is Dave. Welcome to Butterfly Valley. What we're going to be doing today, we're going to be taking you on a tour of the life cycle of the butterfly. I'm sure you've all seen these little creatures flying around your backyard. So now we're going to tell you a little bit more about them. Would you please like to follow me? Okay, now Butterfly Valley, besides just keeping butterflies and obviously concentrating on the life cycle of the butterfly, we also do curious creatures. Now, this is a, a typical example of a curious creature, what we would classify as a curious creature. It's an Australian spiny leaf insect. I'm, I'm just going to take one out of here so we can see it a little bit better. We can get that on the camera. Now this is a, this is a very young, uh, we'd, we'd still call it a baby. He's probably about three to four weeks old. Now they do get a lot bigger than this. And at that stage, um, they will start reproducing. Now what's very interesting about this particular insect, which is also common with um, stick insects and other leaf insects, is they can actually reproduce without males. So once, once this, this, this female um, reaches maturity, she will actually lay eggs, which are unfertilized basically by male, but they will still continue to hatch, which is a, a process called pathogenesis, where they are actually able to reproduce uh, clones of themselves. Very interesting insect. I'm going to put him back now, or her back. Very well camouflaged, there's probably about a hundred of them inside here. If you just have a quick glance, probably you'd, you'd estimate probably maybe a dozen or so, but there is at least a hundred in here. From this stage, obviously, they will be moved to a, a bigger cage once they get a little bit bigger. And then uh, after about a period of about three to four months, they will start reproducing themselves.
Okay, this is our veiled chameleon. This is not an indigenous chameleon. His natural habitat is the Arabian, Arabian Peninsula. Not something you're going to see in South Africa. But what's interesting is that the males actually outlive the females. The males can live up to eight years, whereas the females generally only live for about five years. In that time, she will lay a fair amount of eggs. Okay, this is our exotic display of, of butterflies. Uh, they are not from South Africa. They come from various parts around the world. As you can see, very colorful. This is typically what you're going to see if you go to a butterfly farm. This is not what we do. We, we specialize in the life cycle of the butterfly. So we'll show you the four different stages and um, right from the egg right through to the butterfly stage. What uh, I would like to show you is the, a particular moth that is quite interesting. If we look at this moth here, this is, this is called an atlas moth. Now the atlas moth is classified as one of the biggest moths in the world, if not the biggest moth, surface-wise. This is quite a small specimen, but it, it does get to a, a lot bigger than what that, that particular specimen is. Being the biggest moth in the world, it is a nocturnal moth, so it's got to find a place to hide during the day. So what it does, it'll sit on a branch somewhere. If we look at this photograph here, um, you, can, you can see once its wings are closed, it actually looks like two cobra heads. Now that's generally enough to put most, most predators off from, from actually uh, eating it. They will, they will assume that it's something dangerous and they, they, will, they will leave it alone. Just, just uh, they're actually totally harmless, so they've got to rely on these little tricks to, to actually uh, protect themselves. Okay, we're looking at a, a very big scorpion here. It looks terrifying to most people, but in actual fact, not that venomous. Not, not, not really something that's going to give you a bad sting. The ones that you have to watch out for are the very small scorpions with the big fat tails. So they're, they're the ones that are actually going to rely on their prey, on, on their venom to kill their prey, where this one will actually catch its prey with its pincers. So the ones with the small pincers, big tails, those are the ones you want to be careful of. In South Africa, um, we have got a very venomous scorpion. We've got the uh, pictures here of the first five most venomous scorpions in the world. Um, we don't have the first four, luckily. Our first uh, venomous scorpion is the black-tailed, thick-tailed scorpion. Let me try that again. One, two, three. Black-spitting, thick-tailed scorpion, which is highly venomous. Neurotoxic venom. So, uh, same venom as what you would find in a black widow. If, if, if it does happen to sting you, you're going to end up probably in hospital it's with fever, headaches, all the symptoms that come with neurotoxic venom. Okay, we, we now at our breeding center, what we call refer to as our breeding center. This is where we've actually got some of the butterflies that we breed on display. Not the butterflies themselves, the actual caterpillar stage and the pupa stage. So what I'm going to, I've actually arranged for, for a few butterfly eggs because we want to work it in press in the, in the, in the, in the, the correct seek. I don't know, we're going to go take footage of these little eggs here. Just, I'm sure this is something that people don't normally see in their gardens is the butterfly eggs. If I can just point them out here. This leaf is full of eggs. This, this is what we call a garden commodore. Okay, from there, those little eggs will hatch and this is what we're going to be left with in the following stage, is obviously the caterpillar. This isn't their particular caterpillar, but this is the Pearl Emperor. Uh, very well camouflaged but a, uh, ca caterpillar. If you, if you can, you can take the footage later. If you've actually got it on the, if you can get that one on the leaf there. From that stage, 
the next stage we've got the pupa, which is, this one's hanging nice and conveniently for us to see. They would obviously normally pupate on a branch or a tree. Okay. Now it's going to hang like that for up to two weeks. In, the, in this case, sometimes up to three weeks, they're a little bit slow out the pupas. And then from there, we've got the butterfly that emerges. Now, the, the, the most interesting part of this whole thing, I'm, I'm actually going to show you now from, from um, the caterpillar stage. Okay, to me, this is the most interesting part about the process of changing from a caterpillar to a butterfly. One minute it's a, it's, a, it's a caterpillar, it grows up, it spends about a month as a caterpillar, and then it, we've all heard of metamorphosis. From there, it changes into a entirely different creature. There is no similarity between a caterpillar and a butterfly. So how that happens is, if we look at the, the caterpillar stage, this one is in the, in the very mature stage of converting or changing to a butterfly. What, what's going on there now is it's just hanging there. To us it looks like it's just hanging, but, but there's, a hang of, there's a lot going on. Uh, it's going to hang like that for a couple of days and then it's going to shed its outer skin and what's going to be left is a pupa just hanging there. I'm going to show you the pupas in a minute. Now in that pupa Everything that was caterpillar is going to be lost. It's going to actually break down to a liquid. If, if you were to break that pupa open, all you'd find inside there is a liquid. Now from that liquid, it's basically a DNA pool. There's all the informa information that we need to, to reconstruct a butterfly from that liquid. So it takes about two weeks or so where it's in the pupa and then it will emerge as a butterfly. This is our display of South African butterflies. These are the most common butterflies that you're likely to see flying around your garden. There's, there's a lot of interesting facts that we could actually point out to you. Uh, mimicry is a big thing with, with butterflies. If you, if you had to look at this particular butterfly and compare it to this particular butterfly, this one is actually a toxic butterfly. Being not tasty for something like a predator, like a bird or something like that, whereas this one is not toxic at all. But you can see the similarity with the color. Now this one is basically mimicking the other one, purely getting benefit from the fact that the one is, is toxic and they're the, enough to put, up, put off a predator. Mimicry is, is one of their biggest defenses. Some, some of them are actually, po they actually eat poisonous plants. So they are toxic, so birds just know they must avoid, when they see that butterfly, they must avoid it. Okay, I'm gonna tell you about a very interesting little butterfly. What uh, makes it interesting is that it uses a plant that everybody would, or any gardener generally, would consider a weed. The first thing they would do if they see this plant growing in the garden would be to pull it out. Now without this plant, they do have other few uh, host plants that they do use, but this is their most common one. It's called Triumphetta. And uh, you can see how many, how many caterpillars there are. Now each one of these caterpillars will eventually become a little butterfly. They do something that's quite unique when they're small, they will actually make a communal web around themselves just to, just to protect themselves. And as they get a little bit older, they will actually leave that protection of the web and they will go their own way. Typically, host plants um, are not plants like your rose bushes or your uh, petunias or anything like that they're not going to bother those plants they've got their specific plants and they will only use those plants in most cases it's plants that um, are either very sort of weedy call it call it weedy 
or something like a lemon tree or a tree that's got plenty of leaves they're not going to damage your plants there's, there's this old story that if you've got butterflies in your garden they are going to destroy your plants that, that is totally false Okay, this is our citrus box. If you've got any kind of citrus tree in your garden, a lemon tree, orange tree, anything like that, good chance that you're going to find little caterpillars like this one on your tree. He's not going to do much damage. At this stage, he looks like a bird dropping. That's his disguise. As he gets more mature, he'll, he'll turn more greenish, like that one and uh, become more blended in with the, with the vegetation. Nothing to worry about, they will, they will eat the, the leaves until they are at the stage where they're ready to pupate. Once they've pupated, they will come out as butterflies and so the, the cycle continues. The first thing that uh, people do when they see caterpillars on their trees is to go and grab the doom and, and spray the caterpillars totally not necessary. In the case of butterflies, uh, they, they, they do very little damage to the plants. In fact, everything that they eat, they will actually turn into to fertilizer and that will actually nourish the plant. So, so generally not a problem. Okay, what we're looking at now is our pupa box. You can see every single pupa or every species of pupa is different from the other. From just looking at the pupa, we can tell what species it is. What butterflies are flying around in the, in the box at the moment are the butterflies that have, have come out early hours of the morning up until now. At some stage today, we will take them all out and, and take them through to our flight term. So what we've got is a, a, a gaudy commodore, golden piper, brown pansy, normal, uh, normal garden commodore. So from here, the, the butterflies will be taken in a, what we call a transporter box. We, we, we put them all into a, a box and we will take them through to the flight dome and release them. So can we go down to the flight dome? Ok, 
Okay, so welcome to our flight dome. I'm going to point out a few things here. Um, as we mentioned before, every butterfly species has its own host plants that it uses. It might be one specific plant, or it could be a variety of plants, but they will have their own plants. If you don't have those plants, the butterflies won't breed. This, this for example, is an Elophilus tree. This is for the, the Pearl Emperor. The Pearl Emperor will lay its eggs on here. The babies will generally grow up on here and then eventually, if everything goes according to plan, they will emerge as butterflies. Unfortunately, due to predators, uh, we do not leave the caterpillars here for long because chances are they're going to get eaten by something, usually ants, uh, spiders, uh, primantis. There's just an endless list of creatures that actually feed on uh, the different stages of the butterfly. Let's go a little bit further. We have got a sign up there for people to watch out. Where they're walking because this is very typical of a butterfly to sit on the ground. And if, if children are running along here, they will actually stand on the butterfly. We do lose, unfortunately, a few butterflies that way. They will often come sit on you, especially the Commodore species. Most, most of the plants here are either here for nectar purposes or for laying eggs on, which would be the host plants. Mother of pearl, that, that's uh, the host plant of the mother of pearl is called buckwheat. Now, it shares the same host plant as the brown pansy, which is only at the moment, quite possibly laying an egg at the moment. Typically when we look for plants to plant, because we are restricted with space, we'll look for something that will flower most of the year round. This is a typical uh, type of plant that we would be looking for, this, this Giranta, it, it'll, it'll flower for most of the year round. And it, it's quite high, quite high in nectar as well, so it's, it's, a, it's a good butterfly plant. We do put out oranges, that is generally for some species of butterflies like the Caraxes and the Golden Pipers which actually like to sit on the orange and actually suck up the orange juice. They've got a proboscis uh, which is like a, a long straw which they will actually insert into the orange and they will actually suck up the juice. Now that is a butterfly that would typically suck on the on an orange. It would sit on the orange and just suck up the juice. They can sit there for hours. If you look at the wings on the outside, it actually looks a little bit like a dead leaf. But when it opens its wings and it flies, all the, all the color and the pattern is actually on the inside of the wing. The purpose for that is they spend a lot of time on the ground sucking on fermented fruit. So it's just some, some kind of protection for them that they are camouflaged. Okay, let's start with the leopard gecko. Quite an interesting little gecko. No problems, very nice pet to have. They get very tame, very, very used to being handled. Uh, the, the, the tarantulas. Let's, let's talk about this one here. This is the salmon pink bird eater. You can see the size of the fangs. If I can just point out the fangs there. He's a little bit poisonous. He's toxic. He's, he's 
not going to kill you or anything like that, but he's going to give you a nasty bite. More, more, more of the harm is caused by the, the, the force that they actually sink their fangs into you with. Uh, patience, patience, patience. Okay, that's more or less our tour. Thank you very, very much for coming to visit us at Butterfly Valley. I hope that we see you soon and we can teach you a lot more about butterflies. And the life cycle, the, the, the very interesting um, metamorphic transfer from one species to another. It's actually unbelievable. You have to see it with your own eyes to believe it. Thank you again. Bye-bye. person's fragrance says a lot about their character and spritzing yourself with a delightful niche fragrance has become a luxury of self-expression. Entrepreneur Sade James, no doubt a fashionista, a lady of style and grace, knows that your fragrance should say a lot about you. She has carefully selected UAE's finest perfumes, making it available right here in South Africa. There is certainly a fragrance within her wide selection to match your character and suit any occasion. Whether you are a fan of the fruity, orientals, florals, aquatics, gourmand and more, at UAE Fragrances you will have it all. The most luxurious brands available. Let your scent introduce you.